Okay, we're at uh, two thirty. I think uh, we're ready to go. Over to you, Lauren. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Catherine. Hey everybody, my name is Lauren Drew. My pronouns are she, her, uh, and I'm Director of Member Services and Learning at Orchestras Canada. I'm going to do a very brief visual description for accessibility purposes. Uh, so for myself, I'm a woman in my 20s with gold-rimmed glasses, shoulder-length dark brown hair with bangs, and I'm wearing a black t-shirt with a plaid shirt. Uh, behind me is a white wall with a painting in the background um, and a window to my right. I am joining you. Um, from Chitake, Montreal, on unceded territory where the Kanangahaga Nation are recognized as custodians and caretakers of these lands and waters. Uh, a newcomer to Chitake since December, um, having grown up near Nogojiwin on Peterborough on the treaty and traditional territories of the Michisagi Kanishnebeg. Uh, I'm continuing to learn about my new home and my responsibilities for truth and reconciliation here. So I'm gonna take some time to walk through a few tech notes with you, and then I will hand it over to my colleague, Catherine. Um, so thank you to our wonderful simultaneous interpreters, Merrick and Christiane. Uh, we have interpretation available in English and French. Uh, to turn on interpretation, please navigate through your Zoom controls to the bottom of the screen. Um, you'll see an icon shaped like a globe, or you may hear the title as interpretation. Select that icon, and two options will come up, so French and English. Uh, choose the one you'd like to use. There may be some switching back and forth between English and French, uh, so I'd encourage you, no matter which language you're using, to set that now uh, for what your preference is. So um, the other uh, feature that we have for accessibility is we have live captioning. Uh, it's the Zoom AI captioning service. Note the captions are only available in English. And if there is some French used, uh, you may see the robot get confused and <laughs> spit out some wacky things. So please be patient with that. Um, and to enable this, go to the bottom of the Zoom window and the live transcript button, click up arrow, um, and then click on show subtitle to start displaying those live captions to hide them. Similarly, click on the up arrow and click on hide title. Uh, finally, a few privacy notes. Heads up that we are recording this session. Uh, you won't show up in the recording as your video and microphone phones are turned off to preserve inner bandwidth and reduce any background noise. Uh, but you're welcome to use the chat to interact. And also there will be a Q&A portion near the end of the session. Um, so please put your questions for any of our presenters in the chat and we will try to get to them then. So I think that's it for me. Over to you, Catherine. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lauren. My name is Catherine Carlton. I'm Executive Director of Orchestras Canada, Orchestra Canada. Thank you so much for joining us today for the launch of the all new Online Audiences Toolkit, a guide designed with you in mind. My visual description, I'm a 59 year old white woman with short silver hair and round glasses. I'm wearing mostly black today. I'm in my home office and you can see books, pictures, photographs and a light green wall behind me. I speak to you today from Peterborough, Nogajiwanong, on the traditional and treaty territories of the Mississauga Anishinaabe, covered by Treaty 20, the Williams Treaty. In this part of Canada, it's that magical time of year when strawberries start to ripen. And fittingly enough, today is the Ode Imini Gizas, the strawberry full moon in the Ojibwe language, a time to celebrate nature's bounty. May we take good care of the land that takes such good care of us. In the spring of 2019, Orchestras Canada was delighted to learn that we've made a successful application to the Canada Council for the Arts Digital Strategy Fund, an application that would help us start what was intended to be a very brief, but very action-packed project with experts from the space, an organization based in England that specializes in providing genuinely helpful counsel to artists and arts groups looking to engage audiences online. These folks would give a few conference presentations, they'd undertake an analysis of OC's own digital footprint and opportunities, and host us for some live in-person training in the UK as well. Some of you may recall John White and Fiona Morris's presentation at our 2019 conference in Ottawa, that was phase one of our planned project. We were geared up for lots of travel and lots of learning, uh, thanks to the folks from the space. Nine months later, of course, the pandemic hit and we realized that our project would need to evolve. We did proceed with the digital footprint analysis. We did engage experts from the space to analyze results of our annual digital survey. And today we launched the last de deliverable from our ever pivoting project. This wasn't planned at the beginning, but it's a delightful way to, to uh, round up. It's the, audience, the online audiences toolkit. It's an update and a Canadianization of the space's most popular online resource. It features actionable advice 
and really inspiring case studies as well. So today we'll hear from Rob Lindsay and Natalie Woolman from The Space. They are the chief authors of the new guide. We'll have a panel discussion with our case study stars from orchestras across Canada. We'll have a guided tour of the new guide led by my colleague Boran Zaza, and we'll have time for some questions too. Thank you so much for joining us. I now hand things over to Natalie and Rob. Hello, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear us okay. Uh, yeah, as Catherine said, we are Natalie and Rob um, from The Space. Um, we're here just to offer some provocations at the start of today because, um, as has been said, the internet is full of beautiful secrets. Um, beautiful, inspiring, informative, entertaining, uh, unbelievably brilliant secrets projects that are the result of vast outpourings of time and energy and passion and talent, and yet which never quite reach the audience that they deserve. Um, we're here today to share this toolkit, which aims to address exactly this challenge. Um, more than ever, the public's gateways to digital experiences are the bookmarks on their browsers and the app icons on their devices. Um, where previously they used Google to search across the entire internet. Now many people are just as likely to search within Instagram or Twitter or Spotify or their favorite podcast client. And audiences like to stay within those spaces rather than being asked to flip back and forth between a suite of different platforms. Few people want everything everywhere. And if your audience frequents a particular platform, you need to do what you can to work within that space and make content, content that fits. Um, all of us as audiences, as I say, are still deeply habitual. The online places that we visit and the media that we consume there is based on knowing, relying on the fact that we'll find what we're looking for to, to fill a particular need at that time, whether that's information, entertainment or something to move us. And we're incredibly mercenary when it comes to picking and choosing what deserves our attention. Um, therefore, all of us then as publishers must recognize the need to present ourselves clearly to each online audience, as well as being clear in our own minds what value our digital work offers to the public. Equally, we need to know who it is that we're creating each piece of digital content for at the point in which we make it from enormous ambitious live streams right down to simple Instagram posts. Understanding who a digital work is for can then inform where it is published and promoted, allowing us to deliver work uh, and deliver a consistent offering in each of our online spaces. In this way, engaging with our organizations and our content can become a familiar habit for our audiences too. Um, happily, consistency doesn't mean having to create more and more and publish in more spaces. Um, in fact, Natalie, do you mind if I pass the mic to you, please, to talk to this? Yes. Hi, everyone. It's really great to be here. Um, as Rob says, it's very easy to be overwhelmed by the possibilities of what you can do online. But what we say at the space is audiences like to stay in their lane and conversely because audiences like to stay in their lane that means that you as an organization don't have to be everywhere just in that lane where your audiences are and that means really being in the platform on the platforms where they like to hang out in online we often see arts organizations of all types with lots of different channels, but none of those channels with recent or regular content. And that means low engagement on that channels. And that becomes a bit of a vicious cycle because then the platform algorithms actually begin to demote your content because it's not being engaged with. So you can't cut through, it, it can't, can't cut through to your audiences or go back to the top of their feeds. So once you've worked out where your audiences are online, which the toolkit will guide you towards, go out to them in those places and create an unmissable slate of content right in front of them on the platforms that they're using anyway. And if your content is good, they'll want 
lots more of it. So think through how your organization can make and publish content regularly. You need to make a plan that's sustainable for your team and their time, because there's no point making a splash and then disappearing. This plan should also include the platforms where you don't have to be because your audience isn't. So there's some platforms that you can strike off your list because you know that your audiences aren't there. So that's you in front of your regular audience or maybe people like your regular audience who you've successfully targeted online. Well done you. But what if you want to reach beyond your usual pond for a specific project? This is where partnerships come in and we really can't stress enough the importance of partnerships in terms of audience development. When we say people stay in their lane, that means that some of the people who you want as your audience are currently in other people's lanes. So you need to go out to those lanes to find them. So an example that we could work through is perhaps you're performing a series of concerts that are inspired by the natural world. And it occurs to you that lovers of your local national park might be interested in that content. We would encourage you to contact the national park team and the charities or supporters group or hikers or associations of that park and let them know what your digital content is going to be why it will chime with their audience and with a clear ask of what you want them to do with it. For example, perhaps you want them to share, share a short video trailer and some social copy on their channels, offer to do all the legwork for them and make sure you are making their pit, the pitch to their audience, not your own. They might, their audience might know the names of composers, but they might be interested to hear that someone has written a concerto about their favorite mountain. Use that in your social copy and use that in the way that you slant any of the materials you're sharing with those partners. At the space, we ask that all our projects put together what we call a seeding list of organizations like that national park and the local hikers or organization for every project we do and then seed their content out, seed their content out to them and we find that it really works and if it works really well those audiences become part of your audiences too and cross over from one lane to another having said that sometimes we all need a bit of help to be visible and that's sometimes where cold hard cash comes in so rob i'm going to pass over to you to speak a bit about social spend and what that means Absolutely, yeah. And I'll, I'll start by saying that even a little can go a long way. Um, I'm sure that many of you have extensive experience with paid boosts on social channels, um, which allow you to layer filters on top of each other to reach audiences of a particular age demographic who enjoy a particular type of music and who live within a particular drive time of, of one or more touring venues. Um, crucially, a small amount of paid spend can be a, an immediately effective way of reaching new audiences who are 100% predisposed to love your work. They just don't know that you exist yet. It's back to that barrier of, of secrecy and people just not having seen you yet through no fault of your own. Um, just make sure that the content that you are promoting is strong. Make sure that it makes the point that you need to make that it introduces you and makes a, a fantastic first impression. If this is a new audience, they know nothing about you beyond what this content says about you. Um, and at the same time, make sure that the material that you're promoting um, asks audiences to do what you need them to do, be that watch or listen or click on a link and buy a ticket. And uh, I'll also say as well, briefly, I've spoken to uh, a couple of people who who often say that they feel that certain social channels won't show their posts to their even their own followers unless they pay, unless they pay for it. And my response to that is always this. Only one in four of the posts, approximately, on those more commercial social channels is a paid for post. The rest is, is open water. 75% of your feed is completely organic. It's still an incredibly competitive space um, as anyone might be following hundreds of people. And those platforms do want to present the most engaging material, the material that generates a response from the reader and that crucially keeps users coming back as well. Exactly as Natalie said, there is an algorithm there 
in play in the background that's looking to make sure the most engaging material goes out there. Every person who's ever followed you on social media was inviting you to, to show them what you've got. And if what you've showed them was less engaging than the material posted by other people that they're following, then that other material is going to be prioritized above yours. And it can be tricky to maintain that presence in their feed, particularly if as well, you don't have consistent stories throughout the year. So a little bit of paid spend on your stronger tent pole material that makes a fantastic first impression can really, really help with that. And again, be really clear on who that digital activity is for and publish and promote it where it has the best chance of reaching that audience. Um, we've talked a lot about the, the fundamentals here, but Natalie, can I, can I pass back to you to talk a little bit about how the landscape's changed more recently? Yes. Yes, so when we first started speaking to Catherine and the Orchestra's Canada team about this toolkit, they made it clear that in the resource they wanted to acknowledge that arts organisations across the world have gone through an, a time of incredible stress and change as well as experimentation and effort. There will probably be some things that you try during locked, the lockdowns that you will maybe never do again, maybe that you want to forget ever happened, but hopefully there will be others that you want to continue. But as, as to how to approach your audience and whether that's changed, I think the answer is probably yes and no. Yes, in that many digital audiences are more fluent online than they were two years ago, and they might be interested in different formats for your work. So you may be able to be bolder or more experimental if you've been able to take your audience on a digital journey with you. But fundamentally, you're still looking at creating great work and then creating great conduits for people to engage with it and find it. This means shouting about those beautiful secrets that Rob talked about at the beginning to the right people through your own channels and those of your partners in the right places and at the right times and engaging with audiences there so they feel as much a part of your community as they would if they came into one of your concert halls for a performance. Because really that's what it's all about. It's about leading those audience members by the hand on the digital equivalent of the journey to their seat so they can watch the concert. And that's what really all this is leading to, getting them feeling comfortable, feeling enthusiastic and excited for the great work that you're about to put on show for them. Now, I think I'm passing back to Catherine to hear from the people who've successfully done this over the last two years and some of the great case study organizations from orchestras across Canada. Thank you so much, uh, Natalie and Rob, and uh, we'll gradually uh, welcome people and lead them to their chairs uh, around the round table. Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm seeing uh, Mark Turner on the screen from the Saskatoon Symphony. I'm seeing Daniel Mills from the Kamloops Symphony. And we may get Devin Scott and Ron Royer from the Scarborough Philharmonic up. Welcome, uh, Devin and Ron, and Jean Ferretti. Caron from Orchestre de la Gorra in Montreal. Okay, so let's kick off uh, with your own introductions. Uh, tell us where you're joining from and provide us with a brief visual description. Uh, Daniel, can you kick us off? Hello, uh, my name is Daniel Mills. I'm the executive director of the Kamloops Symphony, and I am speaking from Kamloops to Shwetmik here within Shwetmikulu, the unceded lands of the Shwetmik peoples. Uh, today, I am wearing a blue uh, short sleeve T-shirt, the space themed. You can see there are some planets and stars on it in front of a beige background here in my office in front of a window. And I have uh, curly blonde hair that's a little messy today. Um, I'm all about the messy hair. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Mark, you're next. Hello, I'm Mark Turner. I'm the CEO and creative producer here at the Saskatoon Symphony Orchestra. I'm in my office today with gray walls, a window to one side, and on the walls I have uh, paintings by Donna Langhorn, who is from the uh, Lac La Ronge Indian Band, which is one of the largest First Nations in Canada. We are situated here on Treaty 6 territory, homeland of the Cree, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, Salto, and Métis peoples. Thank you. Now we move into Ontario, uh, into the folks from the Scarborough Philharmonic. Who's, who's leading off with this one? I'll start here. My name's Devin Scott, the executive director of the Scarborough Philharmonic Orchestra, and also the executive producer and editor uh, of the SPO Great Music Digital Content Series. Uh, 
Uh, I am a mid fifties white male with thinning blonde hair, really shows on the camera here. Um, and I'm speaking to you today from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. Moreover, Scarborough is in the dish with one spoon territory, which is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. And I'll turn it over to Ron. Hi, I'm also with the Scarborough Philharmonic. I am, the, my name is Ron Royer. I'm the music director and conductor and also active as a composer, cellist, and occasional uh, producer of commercial albums, which was very helpful during the last two years and very happy to be here. Thank you. And now to Jean Frederic. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jean Frederic Caron. I'm in Montreal, Canada. Uh, I'm the executive director at the Orchestre de la Guerre. I'm not going to repeat the territories because Lauren said, said it so clearly and perfectly earlier. So in my back, I have a blue shirt and in my back, there's a Chinese uh, artwork and uh, I'm at home right now in Cosmo. Okay, so now I'm going to start with Mark and I just want, uh, I want the background story here. What was this, what was your orchestra's digital footprint pre-pandemic? So we had had a very uh, successful run of, for years of social media. We have a very active social media on, on, on three main platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, and each kind of had their own personality and had had their own kind of successes. Facebook was more fun and light. Instagram was more visually beautiful and, and Twitter was more um, getting the information out the door. On top of that, we've recorded a couple of concerts over the last few years that were, in my opinion, not great, simply because they were filmed by third parties who uh, you'd be hearing the clarinet, but seeing the violin. Uh, could be confusing uh, to those who don't know the business end of clarinet, uh, to be certain. Okay, uh, let's go to Scarborough now and talk to us about your orchestra's digital footprint pre-pandemic. Uh, pre-pandemic, um... I'm not embarrassed to say that it was minimal. We are a community orchestra with a very small budget. Um, we have a presence on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, but again, our presence was minimal and that has certainly changed over the last two years. Okay, well, that, that story will be told slightly later in the round table. And uh, Jean-Frédéric, uh, talk to us about Orchestre de la Gora. I mean, still a very young uh, ensemble. What was your? Yeah, I was about to say that we're actually probably the, the youngest uh, organization here. Uh, we were founded in 2013. So when I arrived, uh, actually, exactly three years ago at the orchestra, I was the, like, the first uh, full time employee there. So our, our, I would say our digital audience was uh, really small. And yeah, so so like the orchestra existed for like five years prior to my arrival when the, the pandemic started. So it's it's a bit it was very, very minimal, as Devin said, and I think there was a lot to build when I arrived. But now we, with the project that we did and the one that is uh, explained in the, the the toolkit, I think we, we we were able to build a bit the audience around around a few of those type of projects. Yeah. Wonderful. I apologize for my slight uh, disappearance from the screen. There, one of the challenges of a live event, uh, there are birds having a fight right outside my window. So we'll. Uh, <laughs> needed to uh, close the window and uh, mute myself temporarily. Okay, so you, you've, you all had some experience uh, pre-pandemic, uh, some with a minimal footprint, some with, oh, Daniel, whoops, 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 whoops. My apologies. Didn't want, didn't want to jump in rudely. Uh, uh, similar to Mark and Saskatoon, although we had a presence of, uh, on our marketing feeds, you know, social media, that kind of thing, in, in digital, uh, from a content perspective, none of our our content had ever been captured on video. I think the best we had was some pretty minimal Zoom recordings of archival recordings of our concerts in the past, but pretty much nothing um, on the content side. And we all know how great uh, the sound quality is on Zoom. So I should say Zoom recorders, not Zoom. 
different different zoom <laughs> okay fair enough uh uppercase versus uh, lowercase z or something along those lines okay so march 13th 2020 happens and all of a sudden we're in a global pandemic we may not have realized on the 13th of march of, of 2020 that how long this was going to take uh but every one of the orchestras around this table made significant strides uh, in terms of online activity. Uh, going to our friends in Scarborough, I'd like you to describe uh, a highlight of your pandemic era online programming. Ron, is that well, you? Uh, yes, um, the, the big highlight was we decided to really focus on Canadian content. So over 50% of all our content was Canadian. Um, and in a particular highlight of that, as we uh, put on a flute festival of music by women composers and international online festival last February. And it started off, we have a flute player who uh, really focuses on playing flute music of women composers. She performs it, she's recorded, done two albums. And we started with this, and this was just an idea that really excited people and we started drawing partners. And we ended up attracting the Flute 360 podcast based in the US, the largest uh, flute podcast in the world. And they brought along um, flute societies from Texas, Montana and New Jersey. So a, a, a huge US presence. And then here in Canada, we attracted the Association of Canadian Women Composers as part of their 40th anniversary and the Canadian Music Center. And um, was an amazing experience um, and we the SPL being a small community orchestra this is the first time we've ever tried to do something a, a large international festival and, and we were really excited that we were able to present um, new recordings commercial level recordings which will end up on a CD of 10 Canadian composers from across the country amazing music so um, an exciting experience for us. That's fantastic. And I think it also reflects back on what Natalie was saying earlier about seeding your content uh, by the creation of partnerships. So uh, what a what a wonderful example. Jean-Frédéric, I'm uh, curious to hear about a highlight of Orchestre de la Gorraz, uh online uh, programming during the pandemic. Yes, so the actually the, the project that is uh, explained in, in the toolkit is called Concert Solidaire. So, uh, we're a young organization, Orchestra de la Gara, we're a socially focused orchestra founded by Nicolas Ellis. And um, we were about actually, just when the pandemic hit, we were about to do a Gala de la Terre uh, that was supposed to happen in April 2020. And we're doing one actually in, in next week in Maison Symphonique here in Montreal. And since the pandemic happened, this Gala was, uh, was canceled, but we had this nice project of bringing the, the main two uh, concertmaster of Montreal orchestras here, which is OSM and OM. And we had them as soloists in, in the Mozart Symphonia Concertant for la Gala. But since the gala was canceled, uh, we tried to keep keep that, that project alive and, and keep the idea alive. So that's when Concert Solidaire uh, happened. And actually, since we're a young organization, I guess we were a bit crazy back then. And, and we were the first uh, orchestra to, to present a concert in front of a live audience. Uh, actually, officially, I think in North America, that's what it was uh, announced. But uh, since we were the first, I think we kind of helped the, the whole community to just to just see, show them that it was possible to still play music. And, and we had this huge uh, guide, like held guideline and everything. So that the fact that we were the first, I think it, it brought us a lot of audience uh, online presence as well. And that concert was was recorded and, and then broadcasted online for 72 hours. So that was the, the main, I would say the highlight of what we did. Uh, yeah. Well, I would say that being the first uh, North American orchestra to play a live concert during the pandemic uh, was already a highlight of the fact that it was recorded and available uh, for enjoyment around the world for 72 hours is I think an amazing accomplishment. So uh, congratulations. Thank you. It was stressful, but fun. Yeah. All good. Okay. And let's see now. I, have we, we haven't. Daniel, aching to hear your highlight. All right. So uh, uh, overall, our highlight for this uh, Camelot Symphony has been 
that we were able to produce a full season of content. So the same number of concert productions as a regular season, even if we didn't have any audiences. But artistically, uh, the highlight of that was really a project that we were able to combine artists who lived on a different continent with our own musicians here in Kamloops and stitch them together digitally, which is something we would never have been able to do otherwise. And so to uh, you can read about it in the toolkit, but the the project itself is called Sounds and Sand, where we were involved sand artists in Russia, actually, uh, who recorded content with our recording here in Kamloops, which was then put together for our concert experience online. So uh, something that really opened uh, doors for us as a regional orchestra and be able to work with artists that we didn't have to pay to travel to. So. And plus, something that would never have happened under ordinary circumstances. Yes, and likely not now either, but. <laughs> okay, well, moving on. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, uh, no, no comments on, on, on the global situation. Uh, well, yeah, keep, uh, keep, keep moving. Mark, I'd love to hear about your highlights. Well, we were like, we were like Kamloops. We were able to do all of the concert dates we had originally planned with reduced orchestra. We live streamed and monetized that from day one, but the, there were lots of, there were lots of artistic highlights. Um, but the, the real highlight for us was the engagement and connection we built with an audience that not only existed previously for us, but then the whole new audience. We had over 900 subscribers on five different continents. Um, we had, we ended up with 230,000 people viewing us in 28 different countries. Um, but locally, we got to do this, um, this kind of um, watch party idea. So we gave people ideas of what food to make. Uh, you know, they, they made pretzels for Oktoberfest and, and we connected them with re local restaurants for our Italian festival. And it gave this new sense of experience to our concerts. I, I love the combination of the global audience and the local pretzels. Uh, that is, uh, that, that's great. Okay. I'm interested now to talk about artistic options. What opened up for your orchestra as artistic options because you were working online? Jean-Frédéric, would you like to kick off? Because we were working online, what, what sorry, I, I missed the first part of your question. Uh, artistic options. Were there new possibilities in, in art making that opened up? Different kinds of choices that you would make because you were working online? Um, I would say not really. I think a lot of the projects that we do are collaborations with other arts organizations. For example, we collaborate a lot with Opéra Montréal and with them, uh, we were able to, to reach a broad audience uh, with with collaborations like this. So I think it's it's something that Nicola likes to do. Nicola Ellis, our, our artistic director, he likes to collaborate with other types of organization. So I don't think that changed really with the fact that we we constructed projects online. But uh, yeah, I think collaboration in, in what we do is, is very key and very important. Okay, so, so it's really a yeah. continuing of that theme rather than something that was radically different. Exactly, okay. yeah. Uh, so let's go to Daniel now. Uh, you've talked about the collaboration with the Russian sand artists. Was there anything else that happened that was really uh, sort of brand new in terms of, of which directions your, your orchestra took? We also got some, um, the opportunity to collaborate with other partners in Kamloops that we wouldn't have otherwise potentially. I mean, we always wanted to drive, but because we're all in this together, we had a pretty, uh, uh, we did a production of The Soldier's Tale with the theater company here in Kamloops, which although we work with together was uh, kind of, a, a, we were both looking to produce something and it really made sense at this time to do that. We also got to work with the art gallery on a, a piece of, um, interpretive arts that was part of their exhibition. So digitally, it really did open a lot of doors collaboration and, and our music director, Dina Gilbert, was very eager to, to jump on that, which was very great for us. Great, Mark. I'm gonna be honest and say that I think the biggest artistic option that opened up was the musician's willingness to film. Um, uh, we talked to them early on in the pandemic and said, look, we wanna keep everybody employed. We wanna, we're gonna try and figure this out. And I said, we're gonna start streaming. And uh, you know, previously, like probably most of us on this call, we had very limited options when it came to cameras in rooms with musicians. And 
and the willingness and excitement that the musicians jumped to when we were able to keep going in the face of these challenges uh, was was really thrilling and it's actually changed the dynamic uh, of the conversation around around engagement and use of our product. That's really exciting. Certainly one of the things that we noticed at OC uh, in responses to our digital surveys, which I think we've now done three of, uh, was people's genuine excitement um, around, well, first of all, keeping musicians working um, and, and the, the, their commitment, but also the collaboration um, between musicians, uh, management and audiences uh, to keep the music coming and, and stay in close, close contact. Okay, I'm really interested in hearing in terms of artistic options uh, from our friends at the Scarborough Philharmonic, especially since we have a music director here. <laughs> Who's taking this one? Ron. Yes, um, for, well, for the SPO, it, it gave us the opportunity uh, to give uh, a number of our musicians who were interested in really being featured uh, as a soloist or in chamber music, and then get involved with uh, the recording video process. And then we, we put together a really great creative team. Like I said, most we were recording mostly Canadian content. A lot of times the, the Canadian composers came in with really great ideas of how to make videos. So a lot of our videos weren't just performance videos of the players playing, but also including interspersing that with various uh, video images that are connected to the theme of the music. And again, the composers were involved in this. And so we, we were almost creating like music videos. And so this was a really fun, creative new experience for all of us working on this. Great, um, wonderful. Jean-Frédéric, do you want to uh talk about, oh no, we started with you. So my, my apologies, I'm confusing myself with my own very fancy way of making sure that not everybody, you know, it's not always the same person starting. So let, let's talk Turkey here. How did you pay for your online activities? This is the question that everybody wants to know, but sometimes hard to talk about. Daniel, do you want to talk about the finances? Sure. Uh, in our case, uh, we were very dependent on the emergency funding sources that were made available to orchestras, whether that's nationally, provincially, um, or in some cases, municipally as well. Uh, uh, realizing that the costs of um, editing and professionally filming is quite significant, um, we did have to make some um, strategic decisions and how to pay for it all. And unfortunately, uh, it kind of worked in our favor because we were not able to have a full orchestra on stage due to distancing. We did have to limit the number of musicians. And unfortunately, that meant freeing up some funds to be able to pay for the, the digital dissemination. Um, but it was uh, carefully managed in that way. As I imagine a lot of people had to make those decisions. <laughs> OK, Mark, um, how did you pay for what you wound up uh, doing? So we went a, a different route than some people. We actually brought on a, a full-time videographer who's now our director of digital media, and we bought all the equipment ourselves and ran everything in-house. We were able to do that initial investment thanks to the support of donors um, who really stepped up. We also were able to utilize the, um, the federal supports, um, and I'm very happy for those of you who lived in a province with provincial supports. Um, but um, we also monetized everything right from the get go. So all of our content, uh, excluding like free offerings on YouTube, et cetera, were, were monetized. And we actually sold a lot in ticket sales and uh, online ticket sales and online subscriptions. So that really actually helped us understand how to make this a business model for us. I just imagine Mark Turner's uh, email inbox filling up, uh, DMs coming in from all social media saying, <laughs> tell me more about how you accomplished this. But uh, uh, interesting and strategic investments from the get-go, absolutely. Um, Scarborough Philharmonic, uh, talk to me about how you paid for what you did. Uh, when we created our content, uh, instead of doing uh, concert performances, we opted to go with individual video performances. Uh, so basically about 90 to 95 videos uh, each year that we uh, released. Um, funding came from uh, local funding agencies, uh, from federal funding agencies. Uh, we also were blessed to have an excellent um, a group of people within our community that either 
donated their time uh, or gave us very reduced fees. Um, our, uh, because a lot of our recordings uh, were done at a commercial grade level, um, we were averaging about uh, $2,000 per 15 minutes, um, which you know ran a budget of about $70,000 to, to create our content uh, per season. Um, so again, it, uh, we also had donations from our community and from our orchestra members and our board members uh, to keep everything on track and uh, released. We were releasing content uh, every week in the first year. Uh, we kind of slowed that down a little bit in the second year of the pandemic. Um, but again, it was the generosity and, uh, of experts and professionals that helped us meet our goals. And everybody seemed to have the time <laughs> to, to give us that, uh, you know, that support. So it was greatly appreciated. Okay, Jean-Frédéric, uh, curious to hear from you. Uh, how did you pay for your online activities? I think it's a mix of what everyone said. For example, what Daniel said about having less musicians in concerts because there was those held guidelines that forced us to, for example, have five musicians instead of 15. So that helped. I think it was also a, a mix of luck. Uh, like I said earlier, with our Gala de la Terre, that was a benefit concert. So we had funds that were already set aside for environmental organizations. We still were able to, to uh, raise, I think, $138,000 that we gave back to those organizations. When, when we had money aside that helped us pay for that huge uh, production that we did on, on Concert Solidaire. So I would say that first one was, was luck. And then from them, we learned a lot and we made connections with those, those experts in, in video recording for the, the other concerts that we did after. So, and, and also in the following months, the, the Arch Council here in Quebec and in Montreal, and even in Canada, they, they had new programs that supported those type of productions. So, so yeah, that's just the, the big summary, yeah. Okay, well, um, uh, cleverly done and, and well done all. Now I'm recognizing that time is flying and I'm uh, frantically trying to decide which question to drop. Um, and so I'm going to try a slightly different approach rather than dropping a question, I'm just going to uh, determine who seems to be the most interested in answering the question and uh, we'll, we'll roll on um, to that. So going back to the theme of the online audiences toolkit, uh, my next question, and put up your hand if you're aching to answer, is what did you learn about your audiences through the online content that you shared? Mark. Um, uh, we learned so much actually about our audience. We learned, I think we learned more about our audience when we went to digital than we ever did when we just had them in the hall. Um, you know, we live streamed everything. So you got every blemish, every, every um, dropped horn mute, with the with the horn player saying shit, um, you you got it all, and and we had one of our early concerts where the internet crashed on us, and it was intensely stressful for those of us in the booth because it wasn't working. But the audience waited, and the audience didn't care. And what we actually learned about our audience is that they come to us not for for uh, you know we love the music, we love when it's perfect, but they come to us for all sorts of different reasons. And it actually helped us uh, change our uh, mission statement, which was something you know really clinical and boring. I'm sure written in 1994, um, and we changed it to the Saskatoon Symphony Orchestra shares the joy, hope, and community of making music. And it was informed by those first few months of concert making, where it was about about the joy that concerts bring, the hope that seeing music, musicians working together brought at that time, and the sense of community that all of a the sudden these people commenting in the online chat for concerts and sending us messages from all around the globe all of a sudden made us realize that it's not about the people in the room, it's about the community you build. Okay, so I will simply ask if anyone has anything that they'd like to uh, add on, to, on top of that, or shall we move on to the... Uh... Uh, to the next question. Daniel. Super quickly, and this, this could be obvious, but really what we learned was that our audiences really want to know more and like getting to see the musicians up close and learning more about them. And particularly for us, because as a regional orchestra, the musicians have to travel, we don't see them that right often. So having the digital presence really helped our audiences get to know who was in the orchestra, either by playing or through some of the interviews that we were able to have digitally. 
who responds how when they drop their horn mute, <laughs> <laughs> as it were. Okay, I'm going to march on to the next question, which is around your plans for digital presence in the upcoming season. Uh, what are you planning and why? And would want to uh, take that one? I can start, maybe. Yeah. Uh, actually, the Concert Solidar that we did two years ago, uh, we've been trying for the last two years to have it broadcasted on radio and online with Hazu Canada. And now in the fall, it's going to be broadcasted for, uh, I think, three times on the radio on the radio of Hazu Canada CBC. And it's also going to be online on, on EC Music. So that has something fun. Um, and there's also another project that we did uh, in March this year uh, called Enfer des Lumières, which was uh, French Baroque operas that that, uh, that we, we recorded as well. And, and the concert was only presented in front of the public, but uh, the the actual the recording of that concert will be broadcasted uh, online as well in the fall. So that's what we're planning apart from other more regular projects, I would say. So, yeah. Great. Mark, I'm, I'm going to point at you and say you made this massive investment in both personnel and uh, gear. Uh, tell us what you're planning on doing with the personnel and the gear in, in the season to come. Well, cameras are here to stay for us. They've just It's just been such a successful um, artistic venture, business venture. And so um, on top of now adding to my st streaming staff, we also launched our concertstream.tv app, which is website, uh, mobile apps, um, uh, Roku apps. and uh, and we've now also, on top of the streaming that we are able to do through that app platform, that OTT platform where people can actually buy their tickets right with the website, um, we're now streaming for other organizations across our province, which has been which has been really cool to help them get into that digital world. Wow, that's great. You know, I, the Scarborough Philharmonic has a particularly special place in my heart because they are you know, sort of emblematic of really small budget orchestras with really big imaginations. What are you guys planning for next year? Digital well, events? we're gonna be coming back with live concerts, but we are gonna continue with the online content as well. And you know, we really learned how incredibly important it is to have a strong online presence. And when we look at the, the cost versus the value of what we've done online, um, it, it really makes sense. And the fact is we've reached a much bigger audience than we could doing live concerts. And, and there's been a number of very positive developments within our community in Scarborough, as, as well as uh, nationally and also internationally of the recognition we're getting for our content. So we're, we love Canadian music. We're gonna share it every way we can. Fantastic. And Daniel, is there anything you'd like to tell us about your plans for digital and, and the coming season? So we are still very carefully monitoring from the, the concert perspective what should be going online and what um, shouldn't. I think from our perspective, all the audience engagement tools that we're talking that I talked about as in getting to know our musicians, we are definitely continuing all that work and, and trying to improve that and trying to figure out how to mesh the two together is, is one of the big um, tricks that we're, you know, that we're all think. I think, right now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that, that is so, that's really the big question. It's not a digital button, definitely keeping some of those those things we did. And I think in the future, it will be on a, more of a case by case basis rather than forcing it to be digital <laughs> as right. we had to before. No, I mean, it, it's, it's huge uh, sort of choices to be made. Okay, last question. Uh, and this is sort of the, uh, the rapid fire round. What advice? Would you give to folks who are listening in terms of you know all the things you've learned the adventures you've had the experiments you've tried any you know is there one thing that you'd like everybody to uh, keep in mind write down write this down now Devin. just some quick bullet points keep an open mind ask for help make sure that you tell a story and give people a reason to engage. Uh, finally, quickly, I'd like to thank Natalie, Rob, and Kat from The Space and the incredible team at Orchestras Canada under the leadership of Catherine for this amazing support and opportunity. Uh, okay, everybody, <laughs> top that <laughs> advice. Mark, can I point to you? Uh, you know, 
I think the major success behind our streaming was our videographer. Um, we brought, I, I, we had worked with Simeon just before the pandemic began. He did some promotional materials for us. He comes from the film industry. Um, and he, that expertise of knowing how to make it look the way that people want to consume is really important. And so, um, like like Devin was just saying, the storytelling and that and that's not just in the music or the art that we always try to storytell, but actually in the visual storytelling that that's where not only um, filming a concert, but also all of those things about musicians and your local community that tells your story. And, and I we were very fortunate because we we found the right person to help us with that. Get good people. OK, Jean Frederic advice uh, to listeners. My main advice would be uh, like online content is a huge opportunity to reach, you know, wide audiences. But I think the main advice would be like to to keep data of that audience because that's one of the, the most important things, especially specifically emails of people that listen to your concert. I, th I think that's one of the things that we learned with Monsasolidaire. It was free. A lot of people listened to it, but we had very few da data and data, sorry, about people who listen to the concert. And, and that's one of the things that we adjusted since then. So my main advice would be always have that in mind when you create content and share it online. Wonderful. And Daniel. <laughs> uh, always budget for more time than you ever think you're going to need for any digital project. Uh, and as well, kind of I'll echo colleagues from Scarborough, I think putting something that's unique to your organization out there is very important. So not trying to recreate something that already exists, using the opportunity to really do something that no one else is going to do. And I think that you succeeded spectacularly. So thanks to our wonderful panel today. I now uh, just want to, to thank you and celebrate you for um, both what you accomplished and your willingness to share with colleagues across the country, both today and in the online audiences toolkit. I now want to turn things over to my colleague Boran, who's going to take us on a quick guided tour of the Online Audiences Toolkit. Over to you, Boran. Thank you so much, Catherine. And thank you so much to all of our fantastic speakers and to the space as well, um, and the Canada Council for the Arts uh, for the support of this project. Hello, everyone. My name is Boran Zaza. I'm Director of Communications and Development at Orchestras Canada, Orchestra Canada. My pronouns are she, her. I live in Chachake, Montreal, uh, but today I'm joining you from Saguenay, Lac Saint-Jean, which is land of the uh, Inuit nations. I will be doing just a quick uh, visual description so I am a white passing Middle Eastern woman in my 30s. Um, I have a red dyed hair. I'm wearing, I'm wearing a black shirt and I have a gray wall behind me. Nothing like the fabulous art that was behind all of our speakers and, and Catherine. So um, I know that when we hear maybe the online audiences toolkit, um, we're not quite sure what to what to expect. Is, is it like a checklist? Um, is it kind of a boring document? And I'm very happy to share that it is not. So cue imaginary drum roll as I share my screen to the first page of the online audiences toolkit. So here it is. Um, as you can see, this is the first page. Um, what's really beautiful, I think, about the this version of the online uh, audiences toolkit is that it celebrates Canadian orchestras, their successes in digital, and it's filled with pictures um, of Canadian orchestras from coast to coast. So we feel that we're getting to know them as we move our way, walk our way through this toolkit. So um, I'll just uh, scroll along a little bit just to share with you briefly what's in there. So we have forward by, by Catherine Carlton. I encourage you to read it. Uh, really, really well done, beautifully written. Here we have all the people who contributed to this toolkit from um, the space. So as you can see, like this was really the work of, of quite a few people, not to mention also the designer, um, translator, all of that. Um, so this is the table of contents of what's in the toolkit. And what's really fantastic about it is that you can click on it and it's going to take you directly to that section. So uh, we start by the who, so who are our um, online audiences? Who is our current audience and how do we distinguish that from our online audiences? Um, what do we mean uh, by online audiences? And you can discover these sections on your own. So we have five uh, big parts, the who, the where to find those online audiences, the what, what kind of content for um, our digital platforms, 
and how to do it, how to help people find this content and what kind of content to do. And finally, we have the metrics and measurement. And then there is also a bonus section of useful resources if there is anything that you would like to read more on and explore more about. Um, the other thing that is really fantastic in the toolkit is the different case studies, which we met today, um, the case study subjects. So we have the Saskatoon Symphony Orchestra, Orchestra Lagora, Scarborough Philharmonic Orchestra, the Camp and the Camp Loops um, Symphony Orchestra. So this is really wonderful to put everything that you're reading and learning into a Canadian context and also into um, an experience that that all of those orchestras uh, lived through in their digital transformation. So really fantastic. I'll just scroll uh, really quickly just to uh, show you some highlights. Um, again, amazing images. Thank you to all the orchestras who contributed images for this um, online audiences toolkit. Um, and what I really like about it is that no matter what your learning style is, um, this toolkit has something for you, so be it by reading texts or if you want something more visual, for example, um, or other examples, um, checklists, um, bullet points. So it's really organized in such a way that's just really fun to read. I mean, I, I know I've read it quite a few times so far with my colleagues um, in when we were, you know, discussing it, proofreading and all of that. And every time it just feels like such a, a fantastic and fresh experience. Um, I think it's really useful um, for probably everyone on, on your team, but especially people who are in the marketing and communications uh, department, whether they work currently with the orchestras or whether it's someone that has just started to work with the orchestra. Um, it's a really, really useful resource for them to read. So I know that uh, now you are all very excited to, to start reading this toolkit. So I will show you where you can find it on the Orchestras Canada website. So this is a resource that is um, free to download. Let me just see. All right, so here is our front page. And we go into the learn section, resources. I'm asking too much of my internet. I'm like streaming this uh, video on Facebook and doing Zoom, so it's, it's gonna be a little bit slow. All right, and here it is, Online Audiences Toolkit, and feel free also to look through the other resources we have on our website. And here it is. So it's very easy, you just need to fill out the form. Um, oh, that's from an old job. All right, um, and you can share your organization and, and job title with us as well. And then you just click on download, which will send um, a download link to your email that you provided. So you have a link to download the online audience toolkit that I just showed you. But um, uh, we also have a plain text version um, that you can download. Let's see it here, which is really handy if you are using a screen reader or if you just want something that is more um, organized as a text. So even here as well, you have this table of contents where you can just click and go to the right part. Um, in this one, the images um, also have alternative text. So this is um, useful in that aspect. Et puis, uh, je vais passer un peu à la français aussi, parce que... And la... I'll switch to French at the moment, because... Uh, donc, uh, la so, nouvelle... Oop, I think... The... Do you, uh, I think I need to change my language, because I hear the interpretation. Give me one second. Okay. Um, I don't think I'll be able to change it, so I'll just continue in English and I will let our fantastic interpreters do their job just so that we don't uh, mix up the, uh, the recording. So we have also the online um, audiences toolkit um, in French as well. Um, so again, uh, you enter the name and the organization and you can download it. Uh, it sends you an email with the download link. And here we go. And then you can download it. And it's also available in both the um, PDF version and the plain text uh, screen reader friendly version. So uh, I hope you all enjoy reading this toolkit. Uh, you can go on our website now. Um, it's now available and you can download it. Thank you so much. And I will pass it back to Catherine. Okay, so we are 
down to the wire. Uh, Lauren, I'm going to ask if we have any questions from the floor or if we simply want to send people to their browsers to uh, download or to request a download of the online audiences toolkit in uh, either English or in French. Thank you, Catherine. I think um, we're going to get back to anyone who asked a question in the chat. We'll get back to you directly in writing. Um, but for now, I've pasted in the chat the links to go download the resource uh, in both English and French. Uh, there's also a survey to share your feedback on this event. Um, and thank you so much to everyone who participated in this. And, and Catherine, I'll, I'll hand it over to you to do the thank yous. So you're really thank good at that. Well. So. <laughs> Um, I think Devin has reminded us of the value of a really wonderful thank you. And I'm just so thrilled uh, with the participation and the leadership of our case study orchestras and uh, the leaders from those orchestras who took part. It has been a complete thrill to get to work with the folks from the space uh, throughout this entire uh, project that did not in any way unfold the way that we uh, initially thought it would, but that has been consistently rewarding, uh, engaging, and enriching in all the ways. So Rob, Natalie, your colleagues, John, and Fiona, thank you so much for all you've done. Thanks to the Canada Council of Arts for uh, seeing the benefit of our work with this space and for your support all the way through this entire adventure. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you to my colleagues as well. Um, I just urge you to download the toolkit, celebrate the accomplishments of our colleagues, and uh, continue to innovate uh, as you have done so brilliantly for the last two plus years uh, and in the years ahead as well. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Please do uh, download the toolkit, share it widely, and uh, let us know what you thought of this presentation today. Thanks everyone, have a wonderful day and don't forget, strawberry supermoon tonight. Thank you, bye-bye.